Okay, thanks, Davide. Thanks, it's a Dave. great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about some work we've been doing for the last few years on ring polymers, and um, there's a number of people being involved in this collaboration, but I have to first acknowledge Davide, who's in the audience. This is a somewhat old picture of him, but uh, basically everything I'm going to tell you today was done by Davide. So um, I'm going to tell you a bit about ring polymers, but first I'm just going to make some contact with glasses. And the glass transition is uh, currently a very hot topic in condensed matter physics. It has been for many years. Um, so what is a glass? A glass is a jammed state. It's a state where molecules or colloidal particles can no longer uh, uh, move freely. That they're, Typically, they lose microscopic degrees of freedom. Um, so that means that they can't move past their neighbors. It doesn't really say anything more than that. It's a local constraint. Um, typically, at least in polymers, chemical details are important. If you ask about the glass transition in polymers, you need to tell me what kind of chemistry you've got, and then I'll tell you about the glass transition, and they might be rather different. So that, for a physicist, is not ideal. We like systems where chemical details are not so important. And one of the things, the few things, I guess, that everybody agrees on is that in the glass transition, as you cool them, you end up with stress relaxation or dynamics that uh, becomes exponentially or even stretched exponentially slow. So the idea is if you plotted a time scale, some kind of relaxation time or the log of some relaxation time against temperature, once you get down to below the glass transition temperature, that's in this cool region here, everything starts to slow down, the, the relaxation times get long. And um, the best you can probably say about this is that the glass transition temperature, Tg, characterizes some apparent divergence in the relaxation time. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you about today, everything we're going to do is well above Tg. So any kind of glass that I might refer to is absolutely not to do with the loss of microscopic degrees of freedom, as you would find at low temperatures. Rather, it's something that occurs at high temperatures. And if you needed any more motivation, this is a quote from Phil Anderson, who's really just saying that... Uh, you know, the glass transition is something we really need to, a bit more understanding on. So basically, I'm going to sort of come to this at the end. I'm going to join up the idea that there might be some kind of slowing down in these ring polymer systems that looks like a glass. And because polymers, at least to a physicist, look very universal, we can treat them as strings, uh, uh, featureless strings in space. There's some universality uh, uh, associated with the dynamics of polymers. And then, therefore, maybe we can port that universality into uh, some understanding of jamming and glassiness. Okay, so um, the system I'm going to talk about today is nothing to do with jammed colloids or uh, frozen polymers. It's a system that's like these rubber bands. So I'm going to ask you, what do you think the nature of this system is? So is this a, uh, what rheologically or dynamically is the nature of this system? And if I had, if we were in Warwick, I'd get a big bucket full of rubber bands that I keep by my desk, and I'd put it on the table, and I'd say, reach into this big bucket full of rubber bands and grab one and try and pull it out. And what you'll find, if the rubber bands are long enough, and I've shaken the, 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 the box well, as you try to pull one rubber band out, all of the other rubber bands come out, somehow entangled with the first rubber band. Now, we know that these rubber bands are topologically unlinked. They're not prepared like uh, Randy's chain mail that he showed us, this kinetoplast. They're unlinked. So, in principle, there's no true topological interactions here. The nature of this entanglement is something that's not truly topological. And, of course, the physics would be rather different if first I set about cutting all of these rubber bands into linear uh, strands, and then I asked you to do the same experiment. You could reach in, you could take one of these linear strands, and it would just snake out of the, out of the, uh, uh, out of the bucket without any problem. So there's something about the topology of these rings, these polymer rings, or in this case, rubber bands, that leads to this kind of strange entanglement. And really, this talk is going to be about what is the nature of this kind of entanglement. So um, if you want to uh, uh, do any kind of calculations for ring polymers, you've got one advantage, which is that you can write down a standard polymer description that's universal. And so the chemical details, as I've mentioned, aren't important, provided you're well above the glass transition temperature. But if you try and actually calculate anything, doing ring statistical mechanics is very hard, because you need to typically calculate things like partition functions at fixed topology. So I need to uh, look through all my microstates, and I need to not just ask, is this particular microstate of a ring, this is a ring, uh, acceptable, or what, what's the thermodynamic uh, weight associated with that microstate? I have to also ask, are there any other microstates that are linked with that microstate and therefore violate um, the condition of global fixed topology, unlinked? So that makes um, doing sums rather difficult. So I'm going to tell you today about simulations. 
And um, I guess this was all motivated by an interest um, sort of some time ago, where if you look in the literature back in the 80s and 90s, you start to find some sort of rather, I'm going to call speculative statements by some authors. And I'll let you read this, um, this short piece. But essentially, these authors are referring to the possibility that you could get two rings. These are my two rings. And I could take one ring and I thread it through the first ring. And once I've threaded it through the first ring, the motion of the, of the threaded ring, the one in the middle, is severely limited. It can't go very far. It can't diffuse very far until the first ring has moved out of the way. So that's essentially what these um, authors were referring to. I think it's a really neat idea. But the problem is, I mean, how can you actually quantify that? How can you make any further quantitative statement about whether these um, threadings either exist or if they exist, are they important? Okay, so today I'm going to tell you about two different ensembles, two different problems. One is a ring polymers in the melt, and there's an extensive literature of people who've done simulations on ring polymers in the melt. We've done some too. Um, this is a, I've, a rather poor picture. I've just picked out a red ring polymer in a background where I've taken all the other monomers and I've grayed them out. And first, actually, I'm going to tell you about ring polymers in another ensemble. This is ring polymer plus gel. So the idea here is you take rings, um, lots of rings in a concentrated limit, and you force them into a gel. So the gel here is these kind of uh, gray struts uh, that are periodic and cubic. Uh, and the different colors in here are the different ring polymers. So I've pushed them all into this box, and I'm going to ask how do they move. So this ensemble also has been uh, looked at before, some years ago. I think it's got some advantages, um, and I'm going to try and convince you that it's an interesting system to look at. So the first... Uh, advantage, if you like, is that it's a system that's uh, probably the most widely performed experiment in, on the planet, which is you take a gel, uh, if you're a biologist, and you try and uh, separate polymers by length by forcing them into a gel, just like I sketched on the last slide. So this is a very common experiment. Here are some ring polymers. They're actually bacterial plasmids. So in principle, we could put bacterial plasmids into these gels and look at the dynamics. So this is not a crazy ensemble. It's something that's very accessible. Um, and if you don't like um, the kinds of gels that biologists use, if you consider them a bit disordered, although I think that's in itself interesting, you can also perhaps look at micro-patent surfaces that are being made these days and um, think about putting uh, ring polymers into these more ordered systems. So um, Davide and uh, the rest of us spent some time uh, thinking about ring polymers in gels, uh, thinking about the self-interactions of ring polymers in gels. So if you put a field on these ring polymers, something that can happen, if you look in the bottom slide here, if you can just see it, is this ring polymers thread it through itself, and the field's pulling it this way, but it's tied itself in something like a knot around the lattice of the, uh, of the gel, and it can't move anywhere. So we spent some time thinking about the dynamics of ring polymers, single ring polymers in gels. I'm not going to tell you about that today, because I think uh, I'd like to spend the time on something else. So here's the first of the two uh, things I'm going to tell you about. This is ring polymers embedded in a gel. And just to emphasize the system, uh, we take unknotted, unlinked ring polymers. Um, we take them in a concentrated solution, so they're well above the overlap concentration. Many ring polymers are in contact with one another. And we embed them in a rigid, rigid gel, and we require that they're not linked with the gel. So first we prepare a perfect cubic lattice, then we put the rings in. We treat it as a cubic lattice for simplicity, and again, because we don't want to burn computer time simulating the vibrational dynamics of this lattice, we completely neglect the gel dynamics. We treat it as a rigid uh, object. I don't think this is important. And I'm going to tell you today about two things, some molecular dynamic simulations and also some Monte Carlo simulations. So here's the idea. Here's our system. You can just about see the gray ends of the uh, lattice uh, rods sticking out. Um, here are our different ring polymers, and I'm going to zoom in in a minute, and I'm going to look at what's happening in the middle of that box. So first, uh, let me just set up the simulation background, and if there are any technical questions, I'm going to look at Davide. But um, these simulations were performed uh, using lamps, and basically this is a bead and spring type simulation. It's a Langevin dynamic simulation in which you've got a Leonard-Jones potential between the beads. You've got some backbone bending potential, so you can in introduce some kind of stiffness and there's a finite extensibility potential between the beads that means they can never move apart sufficiently far that you get a, bead, a strand crossing. So we can preserve topology. We check that. And the parameters that we're going to use here, if any of you are interested, is we've got a, a persistence length for our chains, which we set to be the same as the mesh size for our gel, and that's 10 beads. And we work at densities that are typically 10% volume fractions. That's quite concentrated. And we look in boxes that are between 20 and 90 beads across each edge. And that's enough to make sure we don't have any periodic self-interactions between the rings. 
If any of you are interested, um, you can read the paper here. So this is a movie. Um, it's a short uh, snapshot uh, or a short sequence from the simulation uh, in which just two chains, in fact, there's a gray one in the back, but you should just focus on the red, uh, sorry, the yellow and the green one. There are lots of other chains that have been removed. And the yellows and the green ones are interacting. In fact, if you look, you can see the green uh, ring here has pushed in a uh, uh, protrusion through the yellow uh, ring. So this is something like uh, one of these kind of threading events that I just described, in which the uh, green chain has threaded itself through the yellow chain. OK, so by eye, it looks like these kinds of things might be happening in our simulation. Uh, let me just come back. Right, so uh, there's many things we can do now. The first thing we can do is we can look at the mean squared segmental displacement, so averaged over all chain segments, and we can ask, how does that scale uh, with time? So what you've got is you've got a sub-diffusive regime, and then for the short rings, you've got a clear linear and T-diffusive regime at late times. For the longer rings, um, the sub-diffusive regime uh, extends much further, and in particular, it extends into a regime where the mean squared displacement of the rings is actually bigger than their uh, radius of gyration. So this is a little bit strange. This means that the uh, rings have got some kind of memory that lasts longer uh, than the time it takes for them to move outside of their immediate environment. So what's the sort of meaning behind this? Well, maybe the, this is a, some sort of signature of the fact that in this subdiffusive regime, you've got some memory of the threadings, whilst in the fully linear and T regime, you've gone to times where you don't have any memory of the threadings. So that's a little bit speculative. We can look uh, in more detail uh, over the next few slides about that proposition. So um, I've told you a little bit about these threadings. You know, maybe one ring polymer is threading through another, as I've shown you a couple of times now, like this. Um, so is this important? And before you can ask whether it's important, you have to ask how you identify them. And that's actually not trivial. So here's two rings that uh, most people in the audience would freely admit are interpenetrating. But the problem is, if you look on a knot table, you see that um, actually this is topologically equivalent, of course, to the unlinked, the two unlinked state, because these uh, two rings are not in any way linked. So any kind of topological measure that you might apply to this problem will reveal simply that this, these two rings are unlinked. They will, they will say nothing about whether or not they're threading, because that's not fundamentally a topological quantity. So um, we were in the cafe yesterday, uh, Gareth and Mark and I, and uh, there's a t we've seen quite a lot of these knot tables in the talks so far, but there was a fantastic picture in the cafe upstairs, you should go and take a look at it, which is some kind of classification table of coffees in Italy. I'm sorry, it's not a very good picture. Uh, so obviously the Italians take their coffee as seriously as we take our knots. So, um, so okay, let's, let's work a bit with this threadings and let's try and um, come up with some sort of definition. And the definition that's extremely convenient in the gel is that we can exploit the gel architecture. So here's a snapshot where I've taken my gel and um, I've removed all of the other many chains in the system and I've just kept the yellow ones and the green ones. And I'm going to look at a, a lattice volume in which both the yellow and green chains happen to be present. Here it is. And you can see by eye that the green chain is clearly threading through the yellow chain. But again, uh, how do we make that statement firm? So what we do is we um, start some closure operations. So we take the yellow chain, and we take the yellow chain where it leaves the lattice volume, that's here, and we close the yellow chain using just a simple straight line construction between the two points that the yellow chain leaves the lattice volume. And then with the green chain, we identify where the green chain leaves the lattice volume, and we close those not on the face, but at infinity, or if you like, behind the cell. So what we've made now is we've made, a, a, a topologically, we've identified these two uh, double strands of the two different rings with this kind of system in which the yellow ring, I've now constructed this kind of pseudo loop for the, uh, the, this piece of the yellow uh, ring polymer, is linked with the two little pseudo pieces of the green uh, ring polymer. So now we've got something we can identify topologically, and um, it's actually, uh, we can run with that. So here's what we do. So first of all, we see that, um, uh, how do we identify whether there's a threading or not? So what we do <coughs> is we say that the number of threadings between ring i and ring j at time t is constructed as follows. You do a sum over all of the lattice volumes, uh, the cells c, and for each lattice volume, you sum over all of the segments of the jth chain, that's in this case, that's the green one, that are uh, present in that cell. 
And then you compute the linking number between the um, closed uh, loop constructed for the ith chain in that cell with the closed loops constructed for each of the j, j segments in that cell. And you divide it by two because here you can see we've got one penetration, one threading, uh, but we're going to count two for the linking number. So this dividing by two just uh, gives us a weight of one for this, if you like, single duplex threading. And what's interesting is there's a, uh, a kind of non-commutative symmetry here. If ring I is threaded by ring J, um, and there's, both of these rings are threaded in some sense, but there's an active threading. In this case, that's the green one, because the green one has, if you like, moved through the yellow one. And the yellow one is passively constrained by the presence of the green one until the green one moves away, and then the yellow one can move again. So there's a different character to the threading and threader uh, the thread E and the thread er here, which we refer to as an active and passive uh, chain, and that comes out of uh, the order in which, so if I uh, change the identity, um, I'd change the order of which chain is threaded with which. Okay, so now we can identify these threadings. We've got a way of defining them in the, in the, in the gel. Uh, we can count them. So uh, we can look at the number of threadings per ring monomer, per ring uh, polymer, per, per chain. And we can um, vary the chain length. So M in all of these slides will be the number of beads on the ring polymer. And this is the number of threadings. N will be the number of polymers. So the total number of threadings divided by the number of ring polymers is the number of threadings per polymer. And what we find is that uh, this trend is almost perfectly linear. It shows no sign of breaking down even for the largest rings we can find. So that says that the number of threadings between these rings seems to be extensive in their mass. And although we can only access a regime where we've got perhaps two or three threadings per ring, uh, MD breaks down at this point, um, there's no obvious limit. This trend suggests there's no obvious limit on the number of threadings we could generate. So if we took ring polymers and we were able to have a computer that could go to 10,000 or 100,000, this trend suggests that we could generate a very large number of threadings between these rings. So we've been able to identify these rings and count them. We can do other things with them. We can, we can uh, measure their temporal correlations. So we can construct a correlation function uh, at time t, which tells us if uh, there's a threading between ring i and j at t naught, is there a, ring, a threading between ring i and j at some later time t appropriately normalized? So here's the correlation function for the threadings uh, as a function of time. And you can see that first it has a very slow relaxation, and then later it drops off. It comes to a constant value because this has a non-zero infinite time asymptote. An interesting inset is that uh, we've here compared the stress relaxation due to the uh, stress carried by the ring polymers themselves with the uh, correlation function for the threading, uh, the loss of threadings. And you can see that stress is lost before the threadings are lost. And that might seem a bit odd, but if you think about it, if you've got a chain threading through another one, um, the, the, free, uh, the chain that's passively threaded, the one that I'm holding with my thumb and finger here, this one can move around quite freely. I mean, it can't freely diffuse because it's still threaded, but the stress that's associated with most of the tube segments on this chain can still relax. So it's not inconsistent, actually, that the stress relaxation can die faster than the threadings. So we can define a correlation time for the threadings. We say we wait until a tenth of the threadings that were initially present uh, have died away, have been lost. So the system has evolved such that most of the initial threadings have been lost. And then we can uh, drop down where um, the number of threadings is the tenth of the initial number, and we can pull off a correlation time, which I call ooh, t capital, 0 point, capital T 0 0.1. So this is the correlation time for our threadings. Right, that's one thing we can do. There's another thing we can do, which is once we've got um, this equilibrated system of rings and we can count threadings, we can associate threadings uh, together in this kind of network. So the idea here is, um, let me uh, break this down. This is a busy slide. So we're looking at different lengths of ring polymers. This is the polymer bead number. And we'll start with the smallest ones. Um, and for the smaller systems, these are 256 length polymers. There are 50 of them in the box, if I remember correctly. And this is the linking network or the threading network that you get. So if you look on the top here, this is telling you that uh, ring number 26, there's an arrow associated with this, is actively threading ring number 19. So uh, this is ring 26, and this is ring 19. 
So there is, in our box, in our simulation box, a threading event like that between ring 26 and 19. Uh, they've all got indices because, of course, we're running this on a computer. We can trace their identity. And what we see in, for these small rings is that we see a few small networks of interthreadings. Most of them just contain, actually, one or two rings. There's a slightly larger one here. But as we go to systems of longer rings, so here's for 512, 1,024, and 15, uh, whatever it is, 16 or something, um, this, for, if we just jump straight to the largest one, um, this is the network that we find. So we find an extremely large interpenetrating network that contains about half, um, in fact, I think it's more than half of the rings in the system, many of which are um, both uh, uh, threading and threaded by each other. So these kinds of large, um, highly... Uh, uh, interpenetrating networks are generically difficult to undo. Um, so what you have to do is, if you think about the rings, the rings on the edge of this network um, that are threaded, you have to remove one, and then you can release the next one that can then go on and release the one that follows, and so on. So undoing these kinds of networks, you would expect, generically, would take quite a long time. And the networks, again, we see no uh, necessary plateauing of this kind of trend. If we go to longer rings, we should expect an extremely uh, 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 interpenetrating network. So the main body of the text here is showing a Betty number, which is some measure of the, uh, of the loops, the number of little loops in these graphs, and the, nu the number in the most uh, strongly connected component, which in this case is actually um, it's, it's almost all the rings. There are 50 rings, I think, in this system. So they're all rings. Um, so the, tr the network are, are just perfect. It's a perfect lattice. Yes, you can. Well, so, so I'm not allowing the rings must be topologically unlinked from the network. That's, that's, that's required because I construct, I mean, I'm a chemist, say, and I construct this lattice, and then I construct the ring. Oh, yes, there are certainly loops. I'm sorry. In this network, there are absolutely there are loops. Yes, and in fact, this is the measure. This is a measure of the number of loops there are in this network. So here you can see that there are, uh, there are loops in this network. Well, that's just a crap picture. But take my word for it, there are loops here. <laughs> I'm sorry? So um, these uh, represent... Um, so they're colored if they're a strongly connecting component, which means that they're... Um, uh, they're both threaded and threading another ring. Is that right, Davide? You can reach any node from any other node on one of these colors. Right, so um, we can also, of course, do some more kind of typical, uh, if you like, physics uh, uh, computer experiments. We can look at relaxation times. So we take our ring system and we... Uh, construct a measure of relaxation times, we ask how long does it take for us to lose most of our threadings? How long does it take us to relax stress? And there's another measure here which I actually won't talk about. And what we find is that there's a clear power law behavior, but for the largest rings, and only for the largest rings, we start to see a break from the power law. It's pretty clear for the uh, time taken for the threadings to relax. For the um, stress relaxation, we're actually not sure this is fully equilibrated from a stress relaxation perspective. So this is a lower bound on uh, the stress relaxation. So we think maybe there are some hints that in the, um, in the, the standard dynamical quantities, we're starting to see a slowing down. Right. So what else can we do? Well, um, we can exploit the fact that these ring polymers form a duplex structure. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you look in a cell, um, the ring has to come in uh, with one branch, do something in the rest of the system, and then come out with another branch. And that's a condition of it being unlinked with the gel. And that means I can kind of sketch the problem as a duplex system in which I need to have these kind of uh, two-stranded uh, excursions everywhere in, 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 the, in the gel. And that means I'm not allowed these kinds of excursions because they link the polymer with the gel, and that was forbidden. So, of course, as soon as I see a picture like this, I start thinking of lattice animals. I start thinking of linear polymers, maybe with branches. And I'm going to even simplify beyond that, and I'm going to think about what if I treated these ring polymers as purely linear objects, quasi-linear objects. So I forget about the existence of this branch, and I just treat it like a polymer. The polymer happens to have two strands, one going one way and the other returning back again. So if I do that, I've got this kind of wormy picture, 
in which I've got a, a ring. This is ring one. If you trace it, you can see it's continuous. It comes back on itself. But it looks like a polymer or a sausage because it's, I haven't allowed it to have any branches. So this is a over, massive oversimplification, but it's somewhere to start. And in this particular sketch, I've shown two other rings, one of which uh, is... Uh, Pro providing this ring one with a passive penetration. So ring one is kind of stuck by the fact that ring two is threading through it until ring two gets out of the way. And over here, ring one is providing an active penetration to ring three. So ring three is kind of stuck until ring one gets out of the way. And we're going to treat this in a kind of rep standard reptative picture in which all of these sort of linear-like objects can reptate like linear polymers, but subject to the existence of these threading constraints. So we're going to uh, take the curvilinear diffusion and we're just going to map it in the, in the uh, contour length space. So this is contour length. I'm going to treat all of the polymers as if they're linear sausages. And I'm going to, uh, sorry, it hasn't come out very well. I'm going to idealize this kind of fully three-dimensional picture I showed by the existence of these passive uh, active threading pairs. So everywhere I've got an active threading by one polymer, obviously I need a passive threading on another polymer, the one that it's threading through. So this is an attempt to, uh, these red dots are passive threadings. So I've drawn them inside the contour of this kind of sausage to give you the idea that it's like a pin, it's like a nail that's, uh, that's um, penetrating the sausage. The sausage can't get past this nail until the nail gets out of the way. And the nail gets out of the way when this sausage moves through the corresponding active threading and annihilates the active passive pair. So this sketch is the representation of the sketch I showed you on the previous slide, this one, where we've just got these two active passive threading pairs, both involving chain one uh, uh, like this. And we'll discretize space, so we've got, um, uh, now we can uh, diffusively move these polymers, and we'll just look at a later time when the system's moved a little bit. What's happened? Well, this particular ring has uh, uh, curvilinearly diffused a little bit to the left, this ring is curvilinearly diffused a little bit to the right. The bottom ring is also cur curvilinearly diffused a little bit to the right. But what's happened is that with some external probability that we can control within this model, it's generated a passive active threading pair. It has threaded through ring two at this point and generated this new pair of, uh, uh, of threadings. Uh, and then at a later time, what's happened is, well, uh, ring two's moved a little bit to the right. It's actually annihilated this pair, which is now no longer present. And ring three has moved to the right, was attempting to move to the right, but it's, it's pinned by the presence of this passive threading that belongs to chain one. So this move in our Monte Carlo code is not allowed because it's jammed by the presence of this passive threading. And you can see that if I've got lots of these red dots scattered around in the system, I've got a real problem because the dynamics is going to slow. And almost worse than that, to get rid of the red dots, I've got to access these kind of blue loops. And the blue loops can be hidden behind red dots. So the system can get very slow. This is the idea, you know, you could imagine some kind of jamming in which um, the red dots hide a bunch of green loops that themselves are connected to red dots. So hierarchically, you have to undo everything before, uh, before you can relax the stress. Okay, so what do we get? So this is the Monte Carlo code, just following that scheme that I outlined to you for uh, worm-like linear uh, curvilinear diffusion. I'm saying it's in zero dimensions because I'm not really uh, correctly um, treating the three-dimensional nature of the polymer coils. I'm treating them all as if they live in the same zero-dimensional system where they can all freely interpenetrate anywhere they like. And uh, this is the relaxation time. Sorry, these haven't come out very well. This is a disengagement time in units of the hop time. So this is the stress relaxation time log of, and this is the log of the chain length. So a straight line is a power law. This is Doy Edwards stress relaxation. P equals zero, this is this external parameter that I can control uh, the rate at which I make new threadings. Basically, every time I make a move, I've got a probability P that it generates a new threading. If I never make any threadings, I've just got free uh, uh, curvilinear stress relaxation a la Doy Edwards. If I start to make threadings with uh, some probability that I can tr control, I break away from this uh, power law and I start to see something that looks quite exponential see that quite clearly. So the stress relaxation time is increasing by orders of magnitude here. Okay, and uh, I won't even talk about that inset. Um, what else can you do? Well, actually, it turns out that there's a characteristic time. It's not the hop time. It's not the time to move one unit, uh, if you like, one tube diameter. There's a, a time which is the time it takes to hop between penetrations. So if you've got a certain number of threadings, the time it takes you to diffuse between those threadings is something like this. It's uh, inverse square of the, uh, uh, if you like, the density of threadings. 
Um, and you know, if you rescale the relaxation time in units of this threading hot time, everything collapses onto something that looks like an exponential uh, straight line here. So this is log linear. This is number of threadings against um, uh, relaxation time. So this is clearly indicating an exponential stress relaxation as a function of the number of threadings in the system, which we can control directly via this microscopic parameter P. And this is just a blow up of what's happening around zero. I don't think that's important. OK, so we've got exponential stress relaxation here. Um, that's the end of everything I'm going to tell you about the gel, uh, where we've got a clear signature, at least in this Monte Carlo code, and some hints from the MD of some kind of uh, really dramatic exponential jamming a la a glass. So this next section is going to be, um, we're going to be coming back to the melt. Actually, for us, that means a very concentrated solution. Here's a snapshot of our melt. There's no longer any lattice involved here. This is just a pure, uh, pure polymers. They're still unlinked from one another. So um, there's been, we've also, we published on this, but also in the same year, there are a couple of papers came out a bit later from groups who are also interested in measures of threading. So this is pretty topical at the moment. And um, right, so one thing we're going to look at is contiguity. So how do I define contiguity? So here's a snapshot from the simulation. I've just uh, taken three or four chains and I've removed all the other ones. So, and I've colored the chains. So there's a cream chain here and the blue chain um, they touch, you can see at this point. So for us, touch is within some measure of distance that's comparable to the uh, uh, bead size, roughly. Um, but the cream and violet ones don't touch. They, uh, there's never any contact between them. So something we can do in the melt is we can look at the persistence of contiguity, these kinds of contacts between chains. And we define a very kind of stiff... Uh, uh, contiguity function, well, so this is, this is the definition of contacts, as I told you, basically, if any two monomers are closer than the, uh, the, the inverse cube root of the density, that means the interbead spacing, um, then there's, uh, if they're not, if there's no contact, then there's no contact. If there's any one bead pair that's in contact, you score one. And this uh, non-contiguity correlation function is something, it's the product of this, which means that for all times, less than t, these two chains have to be contiguous, they have to be in contact, otherwise this re re records zero. So uh, this records one up until the time that the cream and blue chains are no longer in contact, and then it records zero. So if we average that over all chains, we'll get a smooth function that tells us how the contiguity between chains is evolving. So we find that um, contiguity is very persistent for longer chains. So here's this correlation function I showed you about. It turns out to be roughly stretched exponential early on with a power law tail later. But we can compute that, um, uh, the, the memory time here, this is the important quantity, the non-contiguity time. And this non-contiguity time scales, there's two measures you can take. You can either integrate the full uh, correlation function, or you can just do a fit to this stretched exponential. And in both cases, you get a decorrelation time that's exponential in the chain length. So the contiguity in this system seems to be living for a time that scales exponentially with the length of the rings. Um, it also, the number of contiguous neighbors <coughs> and the number of neighbors, which is simply uh, two chains are considered neighbors if they're within RG of one another, um, grows weakly with n, but uh, doesn't very much. Okay, so what can we do with all of this? Um, so we've looked at contiguity. We decided to look at um, pinning this system, and I guess one uh, motivation that you might have for that is that there's been a lot of interest recently in randomly pinned glasses. So this is a, a picture from a recent paper uh, by these co-workers, but there's been a number of other articles in which what one does is one pins, say a, you take a colloidal system near the glass transition, you pin some fraction of the colloids externally by hand, you freeze them, and you ask what does that do to the nature of the glass transition? Uh, so that's, that's a topic at the moment in, in, in the field of glasses, but we're going to do the same thing with rings. So here's what we do. We've got a bunch of rings in our system. I'm going to call them, at the moment, idealize them as boxes, and I take a bunch of constraints, and there's a fraction C of rings that are going to be constrained, and uh, here I'm going to maybe constrain half of them, so C is the fraction that are constrained, and for us, constraining means completely immobilizing. So more recently, we've been looking at some other versions of constraint, but everything I'm going to show you today is uh, completely immobilized. So here we are. We randomly drop these green beads into these boxes, and the ones that have a bead, in this case ring 2, 5, 6, 8, 9, and 11, are completely frozen. So the way that the simulation works is we pre-equilibrate a melt of rings, and then after it's pre-equilibrated, we identify a fraction of them to completely immobilize, and we ask what happens to the rest of the rings. So here's a movie in which the red ring is still free to diffuse, 
It's one of the ones that didn't have a little bead in its box, but the other rings are ones that have been frozen. And what you can see is that the red ring is stuck. It's stuck because it's threaded, essentially, by the gray, blue, green, and or yellow rings. So the fact that the red ring can't move is a signature, a dynamical signature of, of the existence of threading. So the problem is here, of course, we're, we're searching for a definition of threading. We can't use the definition that we used in the lattice because we don't have a lattice volume to construct this nice topological closure on anymore. So uh, the idea is we look at dynamics, and um, this signature tells us about the existence of threading. So let me show you what we've got here. So first, let's look at this trace. This trace is for ring polymers where the, all but one of the rings are frozen, and this is the dynamical... Uh, uh, progress of the single unfrozen ring in a background where all of the other rings are frozen. And this is its center of mass diffusion against uh, time, log log. So what you find is that single ring, just like the red ring I showed you on the last plot, is not getting anywhere. Its center of mass diffusion is caged, uh, just like you saw on that movie. And this dotted line is RG for the red ring. So it's stuck. If I take rings, um, a single ring, uh, so if I unfreeze all the rings, and I let them diffuse, I see this trace. Now, if I do the same thing for linear rings, a linear chain, so standard open linear polymers, and I freeze all but one of them, then the linear polymer, the free one that's in the bath of n minus one frozen ones, can still diffuse. It doesn't feel this caging. Of course it doesn't feel this caging because there's no threading uh, in, for linear chains. So this is completely consistent with the idea that the uh, reason why this single free ring is not moving is because it's threaded by the ones that we've frozen. So this is actually um, the first, I think, good evidence that threadings actually exist in the melt. So believe it or not, this is actually a pretty contentious question whether or not there are even threadings uh, are present. But this, I think, unambiguously shows that they are because the dynamics of this uh, ring um, is clearly massively affected by its neighbors and that is due to the fact that it's threaded. Okay, so um, what's this showing us? This is showing us that we can um, look at in the unfrozen fraction. So we've frozen some of the rings and we look at the unfrozen uh, fraction and we see how many of those are immobilized. So basically, even, the, even in the explicitly uh, unfrozen fraction, we've got some that are threaded and immobilized, just like I showed you, like that red ring in that movie, and some that are unthreaded and can diffuse. So obviously, if I, don't, if I only freeze one ring out of 1,000, I'm probably going to expect most of them still to diffuse and only a few of them to be threaded. But in the limit where I freeze all but one, as you saw, basically all of them, or the only, the only free one, is threaded. So you can ask, how does the number of immobilized or caged rings, these, so this is in the free fraction, um, vary per frozen ring, so the number that I freeze, and how does that vary with M? So for each ring that I freeze, this is the number of rings that I implicitly immobilize as a function of the ring length. So for every ring I freeze, I get a knock-on effect. I mean, above this line, I'm getting more than one implicitly immobilized ring for each explicitly immobilized ring. And actually, that number, the trend for that seems to be clearly exponential. So for long rings, if I just freeze one, I get a massive knock-on effect. And you can see how this leads to a kind of top threading susceptibility, that if I get a fluctuation and there's one threading, that could lead to a knock-on where the immobilization of that chain um, leads to the uh, immobilization of other chains. Okay, um, so what am I showing you here? I'm showing you the fact that um, if I take longer rings, so this is a phase diagram, and I'm looking at inverse ring length against the fraction of explicitly frozen chains. And what we've done is we've looked, we define a liquid to be uh, a state in which there's some diffusion of some rings and a glass in which there's no diffusion of any of the rings, most of which, at least down here, are not explicitly frozen. So there seems to be a line separating a glassy state in which there's no diffusion from a liquid state, and that line is coming down uh, into this interesting corner, this universal corner, which is large ring length and small number of, implicit, of explicitly frozen chains. And uh, I don't think we would like to take this too seriously, but at least on this exponential fit, there's an intersect at finite uh, chain length. I don't actually take that too seriously. Obviously, this is the interesting corner. It's also the corner that's most uh, important or most difficult to simulate. Okay, so basically the whole picture of this talk was the question of whether or not we ever get these hierarchical constraints. 
whether we get a network in which, in order to move one ring, you have to move a bunch of other rings that also you need to move rings. And this, generically, you'd expect to lead to exponential slowing down, and it should look like a glass, right? I mean, if I take a, some sort of universal limit where the, uh, uh, the number of threadings per ring is very large, um, it's going to take me an extremely long time to undo ring one. For me, that looks a bit like a glass. So just to wind up on a lighter note, uh, this is entirely Davide's suggestion. Davide decided to go into his kitchen and see if he could reproduce this system uh, in pasta. He's Italian, what can you say? Uh, and uh, so here's three tubes of pasta he's made by rolling out sheets and then sealing them along a seam. And then you can turn them around and chop them to make rings uh, like this. And then you can cook them. And then you can try and eat them. So this is a picture of, I think, his wife picking up some of these, uh, this pasta with a fork. And what you can see is right at the beginning of the talk, I told you what happens if you reach into a bucket of rubber bands. You've got the same problem with the pasta. So it doesn't come off your plate because it's tangled up with all of these other rings. And however much olive oil you add, so if this was spaghetti, you wouldn't have a problem. It would slip out. These rings are not going anywhere. So uh, it's a problem. And the conclusion is you need to use a bib if you want to eat this stuff because it's pretty messy. And uh, sort of bragging rights, we have a recipe published in Physics World recently, and there's a non-commutativity with the uh, limit in which you add dough and eggs, which Davide was quite proud about. <laughs> so uh, that's it. Um, and just to round up with some conclusions, so there's two systems I told you about, rings embedded in a gel. I think the big story here is we've actually got a way of defining threadings. We can count them and track them. The number of threadings per chain seems to scale extensively in the ring length, which means that you can just dial up the ring length and get as many threadings as you like, and it's kind of natural that you should expect jamming if you can do that. So what we see is an emergence of a strongly connected interpenetrating network. So this is something generically you expect to be slow to undo. We see the first hints of a crossover to some sort of non-power law, maybe exponential relaxation in the MD, and in this oversimplified sort of sausage-like Monte Carlo study, we see that extremely clearly. Then the second story I told you about rings in the melt. Um, so the sort of intriguing bits here are we've got memory of a contiguity that seems to be exponential in M. This is another hint that we've got exponential relaxation. Um, we can show for the first time that threadings exist, and that's revealed by when we pin some fraction, we see that there's a knock-on. Other rings get immobilized by that. And then finally you know, this discussion point about, okay, so where have we got to here? So we've got at least some strong hints that we might be getting to a system that gets jammed. And it gets jammed purely due to the topological nature of the rings themselves, not through any loss of microscopic degrees of freedom. So this is a pretty unusual kind of jammed state. Like glasses, as far as I'm aware, there's always some sort of microscopic jamming. So what we've got is a system that's jamming like a glass, but it's got the universality of physics, of polymer physics behind it. So maybe this is a way of attacking the glass transition where you've really got some solid universality behind you. And some acknowledgments. So as I told you, almost all of this work was done by Davide, who's for more than a year now been in uh, with Davide churning out papers as they do there, which is great. Um, the Monte Carlo work was done by Wei Zhang Lo, who's now at Duke. Um, and we also benefited from a bunch of discussions. So some of this work was done in collaboration with Enzo and uh, uh, Joe. I don't think anything I told you today was done with Christian, but he's been talking to us about other things. Uh, Gareth was also a co-author. Um, Andrew in Oxford has been trying to make some plasmids in his lab, and we've been trying to actually do some experiments. And even back uh, sort of 15 years ago <coughs> or more, um, co a colleague of mine, Jan, um, made some plasmids, and we put them in a rheometer at Dave White's uh, 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 place at Harvard and try to look at some rheology, but uh, without too much success. Still, I think they deserve an acknowledgement. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.